When Susan Moyo dropped out of secondary school, her parents thought, oh, she would not be able to do anything productive. Luckily, she found herself buying and selling ground nuts, sweet potatoes, and many other commodities in Mbare market, which is the biggest food market in Zimbabwe. Combining experience from the market and indigenous knowledge from her grandmother, Susan has, over the past few years, become a champion in building food baskets and menus combining many African foods and even exotic foods. If there was no mass market, Susan would not have become a proud owner of a four-bedroomed house in a Mavuku suburb of Harare. Makola Market in Accra, Ghana, Mbare Market in Harare, Zimbabwe, and Mitundu Market in Lilongwe, Malawi. These are just three of many mass markets that support millions of women like Susan on the African continent. While many may see these markets as chaotic and messy commodity markets that should be revamped to look like supermarkets and shopping malls, you may in fact be missing out on some of the largest and incredible knowledge systems of the African continent. We still go to these markets to buy commodities, trade, and above all, to share knowledge. While many development and financial recommendations come packed with imported knowledge and big policies, can you imagine if the secret to African development is in an area where your mother used to drag you to on Saturday mornings? More than a decade ago, I set up Knowledge Transfer Africa because I was inspired by a burning desire to tap into the knowledge of the mass markets where knowledge travels through agricultural commodities, food, and trust. The amazing thing is how the intensity of relationships in these markets and knowledge sharing increases with the frequency of participation in these markets. All events in the markets, they trigger so much knowledge for instance, changes in weather patterns like sudden downpours automatically influence the price of commodities in these markets. For instance, if you continue trading in the markets, you see how you learn a lot from those markets in such a way that many people can evade to change their lives in those markets. When I set up Knowledge Transfer Africa, one of the things I decided was to say, how do I help young people? How do I help young people who are getting out of school and having to learn a lot from Africa as a source of knowledge? Informal markets are one of the most oriented, African-oriented reality where every knowledge journey starts with identity and real life situations. My work involves leading my organization in taking farmers and traders, as well as many other actors, into the mass markets, such that when they leave the markets, they have so much money, they can trade, they can do many things. But then, when someone brings commodities into the mass markets, what happens is they also bring knowledge that was used to produce those commodities. And my company, Knowledge Transfer Africa, realizes that losing such knowledge will be like sentencing African food systems into extinction, which is why we record everything that comes into the market, including profiling all traders that come in those markets almost daily. Without such efforts, we would lose a lot of local foods like sweet potatoes, ground nuts, and many others. And the more we lose local food, the more we depend on imported food systems that are produced using imported knowledge. When we import knowledge at the expense of indigenous knowledge, our major loss is African identity.
All other features of an economy can mimic middle income economies across the world. But if African countries do not aggressively invest in their own knowledge rooted in their identity, culture, and social fabrics, they will struggle to build homegrown economies. Well, this takes me to what this means for Africa tomorrow. While decolonizing knowledge is now the flavor of the month in all academic circles, such issues will not ultimately be resolved at an intellectual level, but in real life situations like Africa's informal markets. There is sufficient evidence showing that these markets are part of the missing knowledge chain, including other relevant domains of knowledge, such as farming, forests, and environmental management. Our main advantage is that Africa still has a lot of knowledge that is yet to be untapped. And once we tap it, we can go further. And we can also be able to use that knowledge to set, to feed Africa, to feed the world, and also influence the world, and also generate new knowledge. To this end, Africa needs to be reminded constantly that knowledge is now the new colonial extractive industry. And if we do not value our own knowledge, it is easier for others to appropriate it. And and building homegrown economies should start with reclassifying all existing knowledges in ways that reflect a strong relationship between culture, tradition, and natural resources. And literacy should not just be about the ability to read and write, but to understand one's culture. Instead of continuously tweaking existing formal education curricula, African policymakers should mobilize knowledge from the informal markets and use it to redesign our indigenous curricula, building from local culture and daily lives. This will also assist us in filtering imported knowledge, which does not have the necessary range or characteristics to develop Africa. Globalization should not just be about using imported knowledge, but sharing comparative advantages of different knowledges, including those that reflect African identity, such as local languages. Indigenous curricula can also assist our policymakers to revive and strengthen local ways of restoring our wealth. Traditional ways of storing wealth in Africa have largely collapsed. One of the reasons being that Africans have been incentivized to use formal financial institutions such as banks as stores of wealth. Yet, in much of Africa, the majority do not work with banks. They remain financially excluded. There is a very strong case for young people studying ICT, finance, economics, and many other disciplines to fully understand indigenous financial systems that support the majority. The Maasai of East Africa have had the wisdom to stick with indigenous livestock breeds as stores of wealth. On my recent trip to Kenya, I met a Maasai gentleman known as Namunyaki. By the way, his name means the lucky one. He was heading his cattle near Maasai Mara National Park. And he told me how over the past few months, two businessmen from Nairobi had been visiting him persuading him to exchange five of his cattle with a Toyota Land Cruiser. And he said, my brother, I don't need a car because it is not even relevant to my sense of wealth creation or self-contained lifestyle, he said with a knowing smile. One of the popular financial models that are mostly indigenous in Africa are savings clubs known as Mukando in Malawi, and Zimbabwe, or stock fails in Botswana and South Africa. These Mukando are where a group of people put money together, and after every month they share the gift to one of them. And the cycle continues until everybody has got their own shares. 
at the heart of Mukando are strong social values. Mukando is not just about sharing money or exchanging, transacting money. It is about satisfying solidarity and identity building aspirations. Mukando clubs are anchored on relationships, trust, and a desire to uplift one another, among other elements of indigenous living and conscience. They are part of small and medium enterprises and informal markets, which thrive on sharing knowledge, tools, and customers. It is in such an open knowledge society where knowledge can become a public product that also lays the foundation for development and succession. While Africa and the whole world are struggling with succession issues at all levels and in all sectors, we can learn from how informal markets have been able to build fluid succession pathways. For instance, in Mbari and all other markets, old people who inherited market stores from their parents smoothly move out of the market after training their children to take over. Those taking over, we have spent some years understanding those who are retiring. And ultimately, the old guard moves to the background, leaving young people to run the market. A young person starts off as a sales assistant, becomes a loader, then they can acquire their own market stores to move around sharing. After some years, the young trader is now able to go out into farming areas, buying commodities, or better still, even sponsor farmers to produce specific commodities for them. All this knowledge journey is anchored on practical wisdom and indigenous knowledge. It is the same way through which values of hard work and entrepreneurship are extended to the young generation. Well, I'm not suggesting that all young people in the world can learn everything they want to know from their parents from the, or from their context. After all, the chief may not be able to teach you about mathematics. But what I'm saying is, Stories that are shared in the informal markets and everything that happens there, they lay a very strong foundation for knowledge which cannot be replicated in classroom situations. African countries should not continue importing curricula from the West, which is being used to harvest the best brands from Africa at the expense of our own knowledge agenda. <laughs> Luckily, all hope is not lost. Within Africa's informal market is a latent spirit to rediscover our knowledge, our culture, and our identity. These markets are pathways through which imported knowledge such as, such as proven scientific excellence in biology, medicine, engineering, and all others can assist young people to venture into the unknown and explore new knowledge-driven opportunities in Africa. There is a very popular saying, if you don't know where you are coming from, you don't know where you are going. <laughs> As Africans, we can only progress if we utilize our history, our knowledge, and our heritage. I thank you.